non-material and material at the same time. Both a sacred metal and a secular metal. That is what's so special about gold. Not only can't you destroy it, you cannot destroy its beauty. That's why it's so critical as part of a monetary system. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, part of the outreach team of Silver Bullion here in Singapore, where we want to help you truly secure your wealth. Dr. Stephen Lieb joins us today. Dr. Lieb is a money manager and investment advisor, and for more than 45 years, he has been guiding investors via newsletters, books, blogs, and appearances on financial news networks including CNN, Fox News, NPR, and Bloomberg TV. Currently, he edits the investment letter, The Complete Investor, which he founded back in 2003. And within its first year of publication, it won an award for editorial excellence from the Newsletter and Electronic Publishers Foundation, winning the award again back in 2005. He also has written books such as China's Rise and the New Age of Gold, How Investors Can Profit. And we're delighted to have Dr. Lieb join us once again today. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Dr. Stephen Lieb. Dr. Lieb, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Thank you so much, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be with you and it's a pleasure to talk to somebody in the East. It really is. Glad to have you back on and well, from my point of view, you're you're in the East as well, East Coast. I hope things are, are going well there. <laughs> and that's not East enough, <laughs> but yes. You know, Stephen, I, I want to start off with a question that some of us understand, and understandably, some of us have yet to fully understand. And that question is monetary discipline and the intrinsic link to gold, to which is a title of a recent article on your website. Of all the metals used, resources used in the history of mankind, why does gold hold that distinct place of being money or a link to money? Uh, uh, there's an, uh, uh, a very famous poem by um, Keats, and I'm not very good at uh, reciting poetry, but the last line is, is, goes something like this. Beauty is truth, and truth is beauty. That's all you need to know. Okay, why the stress on beauty? Well, because when it comes to gold, gold is the one source of money. It's accepted universally as money, but it's also accepted as something that is sacred because it's beautiful. I mean, there are Christian idols made out of gold. I mean, that people actually worship. Uh, I think in Asia, gold is valued for its beauty. I mean, I, I've read, you know, the Chinese talking about, uh, li literally, I had it translated from, from Chinese, uh, uh, the uh, party secretary in charge of gold said that gold is part of the Chinese dream. Because gold is the one m source of money that is also sacred. It's it combine it, it merges these two worlds the the, the non-material world which let's say would be described by something like beauty you know what is what beauty is to you patrick is not what beauty is to me but it, it i'm sure that it being every everybody has their own you know image of what beauty is but gold everybody more or less agrees in its own way is is beautiful i mean people have different things to say why it's beautiful that it, it you know affects you differently but it's beautiful. So, go, and, and this is what Simone Weil was saying at the time she was writing in the early 1940s, that um, gold is, you know, it's prized for its beauty. And then she makes an offhand comment because the last thing she was interested in was economics, but she still made the comment and it sticks with you. She said, it's, it's interesting thinking about it. It was sort of like she was thinking to herself, that when the French eliminated gold from their monetary system, people started accumulating money for the sake of gaining power, not for any other reason, implying that when gold was part of the monetary system, 
people were working together because they had, you know, money is very important. And it's okay that people make more money than other people. Jefferson realized that. I mean, you know, if you try and create a society where everyone's equal, I mean, you know, equal in terms of making the same amount of money, that's not going to make sense. Because, cap, you know, it's okay to have a capitalistic society, but you don't want people making so much more money that they be, you know, that they're untouchable. But I, I believe that, you know, secular and sacred. Secular is material. Sacred is what's going on up here. And um, I think the gold, the gold standard, making gold the centerpiece of money, that, that, that was what the gold standard, America had always been on the gold standard ever since the Revolutionary War as gold and silver standard at one time. Uh, then gold. I mean, there were a few years during the Civil War, during part of the Depression, where we went off the gold standard. But, but largely speaking, between 1776 and, and, and 1970, almost two centuries, we were on a gold standard. So we were marrying money, material, money which is the ends of, essence of material things, with the sacred. Gold was one of the really sacred things. Beauty. It was, you know, regarded so highly because it was beautiful. That, that, that's why it was a source of money, because it was beautiful. Money in itself is, you know, again, you turn to the Bible, and I'm not a, I'm not a religious expert, but, you know, I, I turn to the Bible because what you hear there, what you read in the Bible, these are truths that have lasted for thousands of years. And any truth that has lasted, look, I take Chinese herbs. You know why I take some Chinese herbs? Because I know that these herbs have been around for thousands of years. And something that's been around for thousands of years, probably there's a reason for that. So, uh, Stephen, you mentioned China, and um, you also had written an, an article where it spoke about how monetary discipline is critical to the health and spirit of a country. So... When I look at these two countries, U.S. and China, and how monetary discipline is critical to the health and spirit of a country, are we going to be seeing, if not somewhat seeing already, two very contrasting spirits of health where one looks to having improved and stronger health while the other looks to have a weakening health? Uh, not if the United States is willing to accept the gold standard again. The way we're going right now, uh, I think the Chinese people are, they, they have a more sacred view of life. They're willing to accept the non-material as being very, very important, including Xi. The, I mean, there must be 50 religions in China, and they, they treat them all basically equal. Uh, um, they're all entitled to believe what they want to believe. That's not the case in the United States. The United States is going to have to change. and. I think they can because they were there before and they made great progress when they were, but you're right. Unless the United States makes a change, you're not going to be able to merge China or any part of Asia or the South with uh, the United States. They, they basically stand out in terms of just believing in the material. Uh, speaking of gold standard, another sort of gold standard is being whispered about uh, by the BRICS or the BRICS plus nations. And some people are looking at it, perhaps coming it as early as August. The thing is, whether or not, this, whether or not you know, if this is so, might the world see magnificence being associated with the BRICS nations? That's what I'm hoping and praying for, to be very honest, is that a, a universal uh, uh, reserve currency uh, which China su suggested the, uh, uh, the, the the head of the PBOC in China in 2009 wrote a white paper saying that we should have a, a, a universal standard, a basket of currencies backed by gold, and that should be the world's reserve currency. That's what China and the other BRICS are aiming for. And if the United States wants to, um, uh, uh, you know, succeed, get back on the path it once was, it's got to join this. It's got to be part of it. And that this is probably our last chance. If you're enjoying this interview with Dr. Stephen Lieb and I, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel 
And if you're looking for silver at low cost, low premiums, and low storage fees, please take a look at Silver Bullion's new product, Silvergrams, at www.silverbullion.com.sg. Stephen, as, as we're seeing this shift, you know, happen from, from west to east, uh, the shift of power influence, uh, whether it be economic, politically, or militarily, the question no longer is if we are going to see this shift. The, the question is, will we see a global cooperation, as you're talking about, from the West as we shift to an Eastern-centric influence and dominance? You know, it, it's a very good question because you emphasize the West. And, and, and one point I, I, I will definitely make, if you look at China and their military, it's focused on defense. It's not focused on extending its reach you know, across the Atlantic. They don't have, well, now they have a, a something stationed in Cuba, but they've, they, they, they've always been into China. They want the best for China. It's up to the West. The West must change its ways. And the reason I think it's possible is because we were there once before, 50 years ago. We, 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 we were there and we've got to, you know, get back to where we were when we were a very, very creative nation. We developed the foundation for all the technologies we have in the world today. And, uh, but China's taken over because, you know, we're, we're not rowing in the same direction in this country, much less with the rest of the world. And it, it's all up to us. If, if, if this is going to succeed on a worldwide basis, it's very much up, up to us. And if we don't make the right choice, I, I think we'll devolve into a third world country. I, I don't think there's anything left for the U.S. Uh, and that will hurt the world because the U.S. has a lot to give to the world if they get back to what they were, what they were once. And um, this is probably the last chance. BRICS, that currency, just what you mentioned. Dr. Lee, you think we'll get back? Uh, to, to that point where, where, where we kind of were just uh, discussing here because, you know, when, when Kennedy was president, uh, he had said how his vision was he looked at, you know, building schools and bridges and these things all across the world, not war. He wanted to build things to, to help humanity and, and mankind. And unfortunately, exactly. right, we, we saw what happened with Kennedy. We saw what happened with his brother. And the U.S. took more of a position of, of, of war you know these types of things where and now today you have china taking the position of what kennedy was aiming at back in his day of of building up the world schools and bridges so i mean how do you see the, this contrast well, now well, because it, it's happened in in our lifetime yes it has and 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 you make a very good point i mean china's belt and road initiative everybody thought this was just for china but they've shown it's not it's because china realizes that if they want to be a great country or, or you know, ha have a decent standard of living, they're dependent on everybody else. They need trade partners. They need, you know, infrastructure all around them. Um, and, you know, that defines them. I mean, when's the last time China fought a war? I think they were forced to fight in Korea. I mean, they had the skirmishes with India, everybody, had, but a real war. I guess against the Japanese and, and, and Korea. Patrick, there hasn't been one day in this 21st century that America has not been at war, trying to impose what it believes on others. We've got to stop that. That's not the way for the world to succeed. That's not the way. The world succeeds if everybody succeeds in the world. You cannot leave people alone. I mean, you cannot, you know, oh, these people don't count. It's only people that believe in, in Western values. Western values are wrong. They're mistaken. It's not just a material world. It's a non-material world and a material world. You can't throw away the most important half and expect to su succeed in what you're doing. So, yes, I think that we've got to come together with it. The, the onus is on us. It's not on China. I think we can do it, and I think we could be great again that we've got to make up our mind and we need the right leadership. Right. I mean, but why in your opinion do you think that we, I don't know when the last time is that the U.S. really went to other countries to, to help build it up. I mean, infrastructure and things like that. I mean, why, why don't we do this anymore? 
because we, we have lost our faith. Freedom of speech is no longer a part of this country. That was the most important freedom that Thomas Jefferson stated many times that mankind advances when they have freedom of speech. Not anything else but that. And that's a non-material thing. And we lost that when we went off the gold standard. And, and, and I, as I've said, the gold standard was so important because gold was valued not just as a, a, a money, but it was valued as something that was sacred, as was beautiful. It did not have industrial characteristics. I mean, it does. It can be used in industry, but it's not that often. But it marries these two parts of, 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 of human beings. The non-material part, which you really can't talk about. You can't talk about what you personally believe because it's you. It's you uniquely. And the material part, which we can all agree, this is a desk, this is a table. Though that, that's what you can make scientific laws about. Both parts are necessary. But if you neglect one part to the extent that we have, we've become totally materialistic, then there's no advancement. It's all just a, 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 a dog fight, a street fight to who can accumulate the most power. And it, it's, it's, it's terrible. And it, the onus, again, is on us to get back to Jeffersonian democracy, to get back to what Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence. I want to get back to this uh, monetary shift and, and something we have to understand when, when we talk about a monetary shift is, is understanding the geopolitical landscape of it all. Now, we don't usually get into politics, but you know, the fact is we use currencies that are tied into sovereign nations or areas or even zones, if, if you will. As these shifts happen, do you see the volatility in currencies happening along with it as power and influence and economies change? In my last book, which was published, I don't know, three or four years ago, I, I said that a new currency had to come. And the one thing, I'll be very honest, I, I think I've been right, I mean, on what the BRICS have done. I, I, I saw that happening. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not trying to, I mean, there's a lot of mistakes. I'm not going to outline, you know, all the mistakes I've made in my career. I've made a number of mistakes, but I think I've had, you know, this one pretty accurately from the beginning, actually from year 2000. But um, the one thing I, I could not see, and I'm being very honest, is how the United States would behave, how much turbulence they were, there would be. I, I you know, it's just not something you can answer, in, in my opinion. I, I mean, it's something that you have to rely on your faith. Again, that non-material part of yourself and sort of, I don't want to say pray, but just hope that it works out. I, I can't give you a real answer that it will. I think it can happen. I think it could be a wonderful thing, but I know there's going to be a lot of turmoil and I just don't know how much. I, I wish I could, you know, I wish I did know that answer, Patrick, but I, it's not an answer I, I can give you with honesty. It would just be total speculation and based more on hope than, than reason. Right. Uh, but, you know, with these geopolitical tensions that, that we're seeing, how do you think this is going to impact the global economic growth in the coming years? I think it already has. I mean, you know, Russia right now, I mean, the U.S. right now is dependent on Russia for uranium, ultra refined uranium. They're, they're dependent on uh, Ukraine. Everybody's dependent on Ukraine and Russia for Russia is the most resource rich country in the world. And China is the greatest manufacturing uh, country in the world. China, Ru Russia's manufacturing capacity actually exceeds that of the U.S. and Europe. Just Russia. China's manufacturing capacity exceeds that of Russia by, I don't know, many times probably. So between the two of them, uh, they, they have a tremendous amount going for them. And China was never, and Russia was never, you know, part of China. I mean, they're a totally different civilization. They're much more, they're much closer to the West. But we made, we, we created a situation 
<laughs> that remarkably put China and Russia together on the same page. And it was because of our our compulsion to try and spread these Western values, which are wrong values in my opinion, very much stress in my opinion. Materialism, it, yes, it has a role. It's important if you believe in capitalism, and I do believe in capitalism, but materialism is at best half of the, of the situation. We have to get back that other half, that non-material half. And it, it's a very big challenge. It's huge. It's monstrous. And I, I, I can't guarantee it's going to happen. All I can guarantee, or not guarantee, all I can say with some degree of certainty it, it, is that if it doesn't happen, heaven help us all. That's all I'm saying. We've got to figure out a way to get around it. China's willing to work with us, but they, they won't now because I mean, of the things that we do. I mean, if we want to make war, again, I stress there hasn't been one day in this century where the United States has, been at, has not been at war with one country or another. We've got to get rid of that mindset. We've got to get rid of it. Somebody has to come along. Maybe this new uh, RFK Jr., he's the man I would vote for, whether he runs as an independent, Republican, or Democrat. He, he gets it. He understands it. And more like him is what we need. As things are unfolding right now with, with what's going on in the Ukraine, uh, that did spark this sort of de-dollarization trend that we're seeing. Is there any way that, uh, you know, everyone can come back to the table and maybe that the dollar comes back uh, into play? Or is it just really, you know, the world has had enough of the U.S. weaponizing uh, the dollar? I think the world's had enough. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think that, you know, the issue is how seamlessly it can be done. And what I think people are missing in, in this, uh, especially in the West, is there's too much projection between, you know, what we do in the West and what we assume China is doing. People argue China's uh, markets, financial markets, are not deep enough to support it as a, uh, to support the yuan as a reserve currency. I don't think China would disagree, but this is not about the yuan. This is about a basket of currencies. And the more in the basket, I think the better. And that basket will automatically imply a deep and well-centered on gold financial system. And that's, what I think will happen. I think the world's making a mistake in saying that what they're missing is China doesn't want the yuan as a reserve currency. That's not their goal, not at all. They, in fact, that's counter to their goal. They're, it's, you know, they're, they don't want the dollar, they don't want the yuan, they don't want the rupee, they want a basket. Everybody come together and, and, and play in the same play uh, 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 box. And, and let's all build castles together, castles to the sky, if you will, together. That's the only way we can build them. And you can't have one reserve current. It has to be a reserve currency that consists of all the major countries. And I think that that's what they're after. And that's what we're missing when we say they don't have deep enough financial markets. That may be true, but together, the countries that are coming together, I think there's 84, the last I heard, will have, you know, will, will, it will be able to establish a very, very deep financial market. Now, how it will run and things like that, it may take a couple of years to work it out, but it, it, it can happen, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting that, that you said the, the, uh, the basket. Um, it's interesting because w when you look at the way things are today, uh, of course, you have the West and you have the East and, and the predominant currencies come from the West. So this is where I find it interesting how, how you had included gold, because, you know, perhaps if this basket doesn't really come together, then when you look at the currencies of the world, most of the strongest ones being in the West, the East probably could strengthen up by having gold. I think gold is important for any currency. And again, because, you know, what Jefferson wrote is really true. It's, it's freedom of thought that counts. And you want a world, in, if a world is going to all be pulling in the same direction, 
creating technologies for you know improving resources uh, uh, maybe we'll need to land on the moon helium-3 for instance is a very important element in in nuclear fusion uh, if we're going to do this we're going to do it together and, and, and gold like, like I've been saying becomes very very important uh, I mentioned that Simone Weil I mentioned her because she was the least money-oriented person that possibly ever lived but she noted that gold was very important in, in, in the French monetary system once it was out everybody was seeking power rather than working together uh, gold brings people together because it basically unites, it marries uh, uh, um, the non-material, which is what Jefferson stressed in the Declaration of Independence, equality, that's non-material, what you're thinking, freedom of thought, with the material, which is science. Both have to be part of it. And the only thing that can marry these two different parts of humanity, material, non-material, or you can call them secular and sacred. I mean, there's lots of different names, but you know, they're separate parts. They're two separate parts of humanity. And the only <laughs> clergyman or, or, or whomever does the marriage, uh, <laughs> he has to be, it has to be gold that does the marriage vows. It gives the, the marriage vows and brings these, these two ways of uh, the two aspects of humanity together and gold can do it because it's both sacred uh, because of its beauty and it's also money. There's no other metal, no other substance that is both sacred and, and also money at the same time. It's very special. It has properties that, that, that make you believe that there's a, a, a higher power out there. The properties of gold. You, you no, know, you can hammer gold so thin that it's a th as thin as a wave of light and not lose its meaning. You can dissolve gold in an acid and then later recover it completely. They did this in France. They dissolved Olympic gold medals in gold I mean, the gold Olympic gold medals in an acid. After the war was over, they took the acid, retrieved the gold, and then it was molded back into the metals. Gold is impossible to destroy. I mean, it's, the properties are just amazing. But, you know, the major property that, I mean, Simone Weil, for example, stressed, and I think is obvious, it's obvious that it's beautiful. It's prized because it's beautiful. It's it, jewelry. What, what country is gold not a, an important jewelry for? Yeah, Stephen, I, I, I actually learned that from from your website when I was looking at it. One of the articles spoke about those uh, the Nobel Peace Prize winners and how they had to um, sort of hide their gold. And so they one was a chemist. He created something called aqu aqua regia or something like that, where I think it's a uh, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, where you you put that gold in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It dissolved, yeah, and, and then they were able to recover it. And, and, you know, if you look up in the internet, does gold rust, you'll see yes, but it doesn't. It rusts when it's an alloy of, let's say, uh, steel or copper or something. Yes, the copper will rust, but you could always separate the gold from the copper. I mean, it, it by itself, no, it doesn't oxidize. It, it's in, literally, it just remains beautiful. That's what's so special about it. It's Not only can't you destroy it, you cannot destroy its beauty. That is what's so special. And that makes it, you know, that, that's what allows it to be both a sacred metal and a, a, a secular metal. Both a non-material substance because of its beauty and a material substance that you can hammer and do all these experiments on. It, it's both. And that's the only, and, and that is really critical because that's where the world has always gone wrong when they stress the material over the non-material. If anything, the non-material is much more important. But I mean, that's where the world goes wrong. And gold is the only thing I know of that can be both things at once. Right, I've, I've never heard uh, gold described this way before, sacred, secular, uh, material, non-material. And, and in fact, that was gonna be my, my next question. Um, of course, not not being financial advice or anything by by you or or by us, 
is this a time where we should be buying gold? And, and I was going to ask you, what is it about gold that you think most people don't understand? But I, I guess you, you've made that pretty clear. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I raised my hand as somebody that really didn't understand this distinction until fairly recently when I really started boring down on these issues and, and tried to, you know, it's one thing, like if you had asked me five years ago, why did the United States start going bad in the 1970s? I said, we went off the gold standard. In fact, I wrote this and we lost all discipline with money and, you know, money ruled everything. Uh, and to a certain extent, I wasn't saying anything wrong. I think that that was right, but I missed why gold was so important. I, I mean, I missed that. And, and, and there's one thing I'm good at is like putting together these kind of disparate things, things that are different. I'm, I'm not particularly good at anything else, but I, you know, I, I, see that one reason gold was so important is that it, it it manifests itself as both something that's material, obviously you can wear it on your wrist as jewelry, and something that's non-material. You can admire it for its beauty. And there are idols, Christian idols, I mean, I'm sure I, I, idols in Eastern religions that are made from gold. You, you, it, it's something you can worship for its beauty. It's non-material and material at the same time. And that is what's so special about gold. That's why it's so critical as part of a monetary system. Now, you know, the other thing is it, it helps govern the monetary system. It means you can't spend too much money because there's only so much gold around. But it, yes, I would recommend buying gold. I definitely would. It should be, you know, a center point in your, in your portfolio. It doesn't mean it should be all of your portfolio or even, you know, the biggest chunk, but it should be an important part of everybody's portfolio. Uh, you know, Dr. Lib, I, I'd like to um, close out the questions with, with something you stated. You said it has never been more imperative for the United States to find an honest man comfortable in his own skin, who clearly has sacred core positions. So, Dr. Lee, I, I got to ask, why can't we find just one man in 320 plus million? And why can't we seemingly not find just one man in every country throughout the world who has these qualities? One single man. I, I, I think the Asians have, have done a lot better than we have in finding, you know, credible people even including Putin, even though you may despise Putin and uh, think he's a horrible man, he's still a very capable man. He's extremely well educated. Uh, uh, you know, he has a law degree, he has a PhD in economics, uh, and he, you know, basically was educated by uh, a former mayor of St. Petersburg who was democratically elected. I mean, he's not a, he's not a horrible man. I don't think she is horrible either. In fact, I, uh, the founder of Singapore, uh, Lee, I can't, I always can't, re, I can't remember his name, referred uh, to I'll Xi. I'll help you with that one. Lee, Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew. When asked about what he thought about Xi, he says, basically, I think he's a man that's very comfortable in his own skin. And he compared him to Nelson Mandela. Now, this is coming from one of the most prominent people that, that, that has lived in modern times in Asia. I mean, this is what he compared she to Nelson Mandela, who, you know, is obviously a, a very, very good man. Um, so I, I, I think that we can find that man. And I think Robert Kennedy Jr. comes very close to it. He's echoing exactly what his uncle, the assassinated uh, president, and his uh, father thought. And the comments that he makes are just torn apart by the mainstream media. I've researched those. I've gone to, you know, the, the original articles. And in my mind, I haven't found anything, not one example of something he said that I would call outright false. I mean, whether it be the, the dangers in a measles vaccine, his family's all vaccinated. 
are, or, you know, the dangers in a particular use of, uh, uh, of the dangers in using mRNA as a vaccine for COVID. There's, there's many pieces of literature. It doesn't mean that it's right. But what he's saying, basically, as I understand him, he, he, he's saying that we should investigate this. These are things we should not take for granted. And I think he genuinely believes in peace, in world peace, just like his uh, uncle did in that, that, that speech I, I was mentioning. Uh, and he could be the answer. And there might be others that are like him. I think Musk, strangely enough, uh, although, I mean, he's never going to be president. One thing, he was born in South Africa. But, but I, you know, and as rich as he is, he's not someone who worships money. He worships you know, humanity. He wants humanity to be peaceful. You know where Musk made all his money? He didn't make it in the U.S. He made it in China by opening those factories in China. Before he went into China, you look at the stock chart, he, he, was, he was struggling. And then all of a sudden, he took off. And, you know, and look at the projects that he's interested in. He's not interested, he's only interested in social media to the extent he thinks it's it's not free. He wanted to, he, he invested $44 billion in what will probably be a totally losing operation just to create what he calls a, a, a town hall and to counter the other social media. I mean, it's a man that, that, that cares about the world. You may hate him. You might find him too hard to take. You may envy him for being, you know, so wealthy, but he, he's, he, RFK Jr., are examples of people that I think that exist in this country that could make a very big difference. Very big difference. Dr. Stephen Lee, before we wrap up, can you tell us how people can find more of your work and services and where we can find you on social media? I, 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 well, I have a presence on Facebook and uh, um, what Twitter, but I, I don't do that my, uh, my, my, myself, uh, somebody else does it. But the, the best place to read what I'm writing is on my website, stephenleib.com. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I also edit an advisory service. I, I'm, a, I'm a money manager, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, my life is now based on completing this book and contributing whatever I can to understanding the kinds of consequences that we face. I'm much more concerned about you know, the, the, finishing this book before I leave this earth. Um, and that's where the best, the best place to look for me is stephenleib.com. That's where I post my writing. And I guess some of it gets posted on Twitter and Facebook. But uh, what I post on stephenleib.com, the next thing I post will probably be the a total outline of the book. It'll be the first chapter and it will outline everything. And it may also be the preface, which tells you why I really got into this. But that, that I'm not going to do that on, on social media. I'm going to do that in my website. If somebody else posts it on social media, that's fine with me. I mean, I'd love for them to get the word across, but I'm, I'm not advertising services here. I'm advertising knowledge that, that I think everybody should have for their own sake, really. All right. Dr. Stephen Leap, we appreciate the time you've given, and I, I really do hope we can we can do this again soon, and I, I look forward to that book coming out. Yes, I hope I, you know, you're going to have to wait a couple of years, I think, for me to finish it. I'm a slow writer, but I'm going to get it done. And I again, I will be posting parts of that book on my website, stephenleap.com. That was Dr. Stephen Leap sharing his views about the economy and what gold truly is. If you'd like to see more of Stephen's views, please visit his website, www.stephenleib.com. If you like this interview, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, sharing it with friends, giving us a like and a thumbs up. All are greatly appreciated. Audio-only versions of this interview can be found on iTunes and Spotify.